Monica Charette, and this is Holding the Light. As long as you love, I will whisper in your ear. Little whispers you will hear. As long as you love. In today's podcast, my son Colby and I are talking to our dear friend Linda Hartkoff. Linda, with her husband Doug, operate an organic dairy farm and educational center in Albion, Maine. Linda is brave, she is strong, she's forthright and insightful, and she is the mother of an amazing young man whose life was lost at the age of 25 to the disease of addiction. The courage required for a mother to step forward and publicly share such an excruciating journey speaks to the kind and compassionate heart with which Linda has long lived her life. Listening to her speak about her son, Dylan, it becomes clear that he lived with a similar heart. My friend raised a beautiful human being whose life was overtaken by a disease that is rampant in our society which means that she is not alone in her anguish. And that is why Linda has agreed to join us here on Holding the Light, with the hope that her experience, her pain, her understanding might touch the heart of another parent living through a similar journey. Today, Colby and I are Holding the Light with Linda Hartkoff. Hi, Linda. Hi. Hey, welcome to Holding the Light. I know we took you away from your daily chores. Um, you did tell me you were vaccinating heifers. Is that what we talked about? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so thank you for being with us today. Um, you've always been very open about the challenges uh, both your son and your family have faced. And I know sharing your experience today will be very impactful for others. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. Yeah, so I I think we could start somewhere kind of basic. I think when we're talking about addiction, especially for mom and I, we're sort of insulated. And sometimes we don't know necessarily if that's because we're just fortunate enough to be insulated from it or if it's that the stigma surrounding it causes people to not want to share information um, or if it's embarrassing. And so first, I just want to say thank you for being here to talk about this. Um, And then I want to start with your son, Dylan. Uh, What specifically... um, was he addicted to? When did you find out? How did you find out? And what was that process like? What first steps did you take once you found out? I think the first time we knew that he had an issue was um, we got a call from the police. Um, he was arrested for selling marijuana or pot on campus. Um, and looking back at that situation, we try to figure out where couldn't understand how this could happen. I think the kids and my, my children and his friends knew that he was starting to wander down this road and didn't let on to us. But what happened was he was arrested for having a substantial amount of um, marijuana on him and was put in jail and was able to be released and then had a court date. He struggled to stay in school at this time. But what was really interesting is that the judge went easy on him because he was only 17 and said, well, if you can pay a fine, great. Um, We'll do that because it's your first offense. In hindsight, it would have been great if they had strongly suggested that or mandatory that he attend um, some kind of counseling, drug addiction counseling at that time because his feeling was, I got off. I'm good to go. I'm invincible. And it wasn't until, let's see, two, three, two and a half, three years later, just after Kaz, that um, we actually got a call from his girlfriend saying, you need to come get him. He's using Xanax. He's over his head. The next day we got a call from his, the girlfriend's mother. And she said, no, he's using heroin and you need to get him out because it's a bad situation. And he was living where then? He was living in Portland at the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so scary, so scary because the reality is 
there's nothing you can do unless they want to help themselves. I remember calling the local uh, detox center and asking them if I could tie them to the roof of the car and haul them in <laughs> and so we could, could detox. And I mean, this is all new to us. This mm-hmm. was all new. And uh, they're like, no, he has, he has to come in on his own. And, and that was the scary part, knowing that he was using and wasn't, wasn't ready to give it up was embarrassed that he had been caught and we a friend and I actually went to Portland about midnight to try to catch up with him and he was running and I apparently his house was definitely a place to buy drugs but the long the short is he did he did come with us or not that night he said he would come um, and we were able to get him to Penn Bay for detox at for the start of things mm-hmm but it's it's scary because you don't you hear it happening to other families. You don't think of it invading your own family and how that could even happen. You look back and you say, in hindsight, there were clues, but at the time it didn't it didn't add up. It didn't add up. So So that transition from like marijuana to harder drugs happened at some point when it wasn't under your roof when he had moved on and Correct. left the house yet. Correct. He had mm-hmm. actually left Machias where he was attending school and went to um, Portland to live and attend the community college. And you, you're, you're thinking, okay, that's, you know, they're, they're adults now. They should be able to manage their own life. How much do you cater to them? Mm-hmm. He did manage to go to the boat school and Arundel and for a 12, uh, 10 month program, which was really great. So I don't think at that point he was as heavy into drugs. It was shortly after, um, I think it escalated for him. Mm -hmm. And it can happen quick too. I hear, you know, it only takes a week or so and you can become violently dependent on the substance. It can be just 48 hours before you're hooked for life. Mm -hmm. Well, and everyone's wired differently. Yeah. And you don't know, like my, my older son was like, well, I don't understand why you can't just give it up. Right. Just like that. He said, I've tried stuff and it hasn't affected me. Everyone's differently. And it, a lot of it has to do with mental health that you don't realize. Um, and then, you know, why they start using. And then it's a point of it, it takes hold of them. And it becomes this vicious cycle for them. And it's not like they chose this path you know it's like that they were born to go down this path it's something that would for whatever reason it got a hold of them to to i don't know in some ways fill the void that was in them maybe or i'm not sure it's hard to say why every why people use it's each for a different reason and it's hard not knowing right as a mom yeah it's it's not knowing and realizing like I wish his friends had said something mm-hmm. sooner, mm-hmm. you know, I, that he was, he was in trouble and yeah, it's not knowing. And it's also when they're using, worrying about them, mm. you know, are they going to be safe? Are they, you know, are, are they going to come home? Okay. Yeah. You know, when they're, when they're living under your roof or, um, right. are they, you know, at one point I remember asking Dylan, do you even have our address and phone number in your wallet in case something happens? That they'll know how to get a hold of us. That's such a different fear than most parents have, too. We all have fears, but we don't think about that one. Um, and you're such hopeful people, and I know that you and Doug went to great lengths to save Dylan. I know you did, because you talked with me about it many times, and... Um, it must have been hard just anticipating the phone call too, right? All the time. Yeah, I think that's that's always your worst nightmare, you know, when that happens, that phone call. And we did. He he had some success. He was in rehab. He had some success, some setbacks. I I do grant him that he always gave me permission or us permission to to be involved and to be able to ask the docs questions that he didn't cut us out of his life. So he was trying, he was really trying. And the times that he slid, he was so embarrassed. 
and trying to encourage them saying, you know, it happens. It's hard. It's really hard. What you chose to do is really challenging. Mm-hmm. And it's going to take a lot of inner strength or something to help you get you through this. Yeah. Um, but like I said, as parents, you can't make it better. I mean, you can't hold them. You can't, you know, you just, yeah, you, it's it's their journey. And all you could do is love them and, and, and talk to them and keep the communications open. But when he was living home, I guess the hard part was that... Um, Along with the drug comes the lying, the cheating, the stealing. And you didn't raise your kids to do that. You know, I, he, he, he would write checks, take checks from our checkbook, write them checks. I mean, that was so disheartening t- to see hap- when we found out what was happening. But they aren't the, the person you, you knew. Yeah, they're not. They just, this whole, they change. They, it's, and it's the drugs. It's, it's the drugs that t- overtake their lives. And you had mentioned that it's a process of kind of, ba- it's a balancing act where trying to keep yourself in check of understanding there isn't something that you can directly do to just change this overnight and that it's collaborative. And a lot of it does come from a, a, you know, your son having to be a willing participant in his recovery and how hard that is. And is that something that you knew that you were, didn't have that capability or that power? Or is that something you learned through this process that, oh, I, you know, I'm a little bit hopeless in this? Or having that feeling. Yeah, I think I I definitely knew there. Were, you know, I reached out to a bunch of people. I have friends that are in substance abuse counseling world, and were able to reach out to them. You know, I had the basic understanding that knowing deep down that there we couldn't do anything. I mean, that it really had to come from him, and that's the hardest. That was the hardest thing, is to you know, know that he was using and that how it could impact his life and but didn't know like at that time where to turn for other resources i think as a family going through this you feel very isolated uh, you know i don't think for me i wasn't embarrassed about it it was a process because i was just talking to people to help myself as well but I know families do become very isolated because of the stigma that goes along with this. I was going to ask you about that because it's, um, it carries such a social discrimination, I guess, you know, that makes people hide the cause of their child's passing. But you never did that. I mean, even his obituary, you, you, shared, you shared everything. Yeah, I felt it was important. I felt it was really important to know the truth about, about him and his... You know, he was just this amazing kid. I mean, he was just an amazing individual that always looked after the underdog. Even even when he was in recovery um, and using, he managed to, he had a friend that OD'd and he was able to keep him alive with CPR. He was able to get a bunch of good friends into rehab who are clean today. He met a friend down there and he used to tell me, he was going through detox and, and, and rehab and he and Dylan were roommates and Dylan would come up with these crazy stories about alien sheep jumping out of planes with (laughs) something, but it just, it just, it helped him during those scary moments when you were, you know, struggling with what was happening in your head and your body. He said, he just, it just really helped him to have a good friend like that. Um, and so that was that was really, really encouraging to hear how many lives he's he really touched. and he he did care for the, I don't want to say the underdog, but those less less privileged or le- our needed assistance, he he really cared for them. Dylan's illness did not um, define the sum of his life. right. But um, I think I, going back to when, well, one of the things I've done recently is that, you know, I got involved with uh, the Waterville's uh, Operation Hope that, yes. that helps, you know, those individuals who are seeking help can come to the police stations, no questions asked, and they will try to find them um, some help, whether it's detox or rehab. And so we become angels that help place individuals who are looking. Um, COVID's kind of put a kibosh to a lot of us participating, 
um, there's still a need. And I think it's being met with other, with individuals. But another way that I've learned to reach out recently was I got involved with um, an organization called the Partnership to End Addiction. And they offered a six week parent coaches training where basically you learn techniques around motivational interviewing and other techniques on how parents can talk to their kids who are going through substance abuse disorder and helping them maintain an open relationship. So it's, and not get caught. Cause I know when you're, when we were, when I was going through it and Doug, it takes a real toll on, on your own person that your own um, health and men, mental capacity. I mean, it, I'm you, sure. yeah, you just, it eats at you. It eats at you for sure. And so this, this organization is a way for parents to connect with other parents and share our story, but also how to change that dialogue so you're not rubbing them wrong or fighting with them to kind of opening those doors because the theory is that through love and communication that, that they will allow for these individuals to try to seek the help that they need. And it may not help it happen for all, but it, it's a way to help parents find that peace within them, this, themselves while helping their kids. You really, you found a way to turn your grief into some action that will help others. And that's really admirable. What, what would you tell a parent then that's feeling this way right now that they're, they're scared for their child and what, what's that, what's the piece of advice you would give them to start with? Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I really believe about this organization calling out to the partnership um, and t- being able to talk with other parents who have gone through this. Mm-hmm. Um, again, the isolation, you're not alone. You're not alone. And there is help. And there's help for you to find your own peace um, while your your loved one finds their way or journey to recovery. And I guess that would be it. But to reach out and not to isolate yourself. Yeah. We should mention, I made note of this, the, to access, it's the Partnership to End Addiction. And you can visit their website at um, drugfree.org. Yeah. And you can click on Get Support Now and get connected to free confidential support, including parent coaching. And I, you might even be lucky enough to get Linda on the line, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's from what I understand, they have about 30, 40 coaches across the country. And, and these individuals, other parents are, you know, some are recovery, some are still actively using, some are in jail, some have lost their children. So there really, there's a wide gamut of individuals that have also felt this real desire to help other parents who are going, who are going through this, you know, and it could be, it could be partners too, mm-hmm. not right. just parents, but, you know, a partner, baby become dependent right and so we were talking a little bit about um advice that you might give to somebody else um another parent but you also um or dylan also had two siblings and so as his addiction um came out how did you communicate that with your family did you guys sit down and talk about how you wanted to handle this and how you wanted to help dylan as a family did were you nervous about telling um your other children or what was that experience like I think they probably knew before us. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I think they did. I, I think they knew that he was definitely not on a good track, maybe not to the degree, but friends would talk. Yeah. And I think, you know, word would get around. I think we didn't actually sit down like a family and how are we going to dress? Everyone was in different places at the time. I think, I think for Doug and I, it was hard trying to figure this out. Um, I think I did, a, I took on most of the role of trying to f- figure out like who we could contact or what, who are the resources. Um, it, I, and, and people, you know, partners handle it differently, right? They handle it very differently. Our oldest son, well, I should back up. I should say, you know, I think for Marilla, sh- she's like, what do I tell people? How do I, you know, how do I tell people? And I said, well, you just tell them the truth. I mean, that's really is, it's, it's just, you know, it's just something that 
he ventured down and it just took hold of him. It's an like illness. Said, early, yeah, it's an illness. Mm-hmm. It's a, and that really it is. And it, it affects people differently. So it's, it's, it really sucks it happened. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, miss him every day. Yeah, we'll continue to miss him. You know. But, um, but yeah, as a family, we did. I mean, I think for like, just talking about our oldest, yeah, I think it was hard to understand, well, why couldn't he stop? Yeah. You know, why, you know, why can't they just stop and not realizing, you know, that it is a disease and it, it takes a lot, you know, your whole brain chemistry gets rewired depending on how much you're using. I think one of the, the hardest things, you know, looking at brain chemistry was the hardest thing was sitting with Dylan a month before his passing and him saying, I don't know how to have joy anymore. Oh. I don't know how to to have fun. And that was really hard for you know seeing this guy who really you know was easygoing, and then learning after the fact that his own personal anxieties that he had that I never knew you know that he had around people and and large groups because he had a way of masking those insecurities, you know? So it's like, what do you tell your, what do you tell your kid when they say something like that? Oh, it's going to be better tomorrow. You know, it's suck it up. Right. And then I talked to one of the counselors in this parent coaching and they were just saying, it's, you just have to acknowledge, acknowledge what he's feeling. And you don't know, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But in this moment, I hear you. I hear that it's just really hard for you and that you really are struggling with this. You said that was about a month before his passing. Was that the last time you saw him? Yeah, that was the last time. So he was in a he was in a rehab and it turned out to be quite a large facility, which probably, you know, in hindsight again, you don't know, wasn't the best place for him. But he finished his 30-day program. And at that point, they had parents come in or family members come in to meet with their loved ones and to visit with them. And this particular program was a six-month program. He actually had made plans to leave and go to Pennsylvania to be with his girlfriend and finish, you know, rehab up there. And I was adamant he'd stay and finish. You know, we were out of money. I mean, it's just the cost of this is like, this is all we got. We don't, we don't have anything else for you. And he started working as well as doing outpatient, living in a sober house within this community. And I think about three weeks he had started taking, and I can't think of the particular shot that they give him or drug instead of um, Suboxone. It was another type to help with addiction cravings. And he called to say they were having trouble with his insurance and it i really feel like during his his rehab there were so many missing pieces like um he would call and say i haven't heard from my counselor or i haven't heard from this person or he got out of one rehab and they they didn't have a, a sober house for them to go to and they were scrambling to find one but in the the owner or manager promised that they would do this, this, and this, like help them find a job and help them get it going. And, and it just didn't happen. It just, Mm -hmm. it just didn't happen. And so what happened with Dylan is um, we, we know that uh, on the eve of his passing, he talked to his girlfriend till one o'clock in the morning and about nine nine o'clock the next day we got a call um that he had passed um he was he was actually in the sober house in the bathroom and it decided to use for whatever reason and it was laced with fentanyl and help was there i mean it was right there and he was all we didn't know at the time that he was all packed ready to go to pennsylvania to be with his girlfriend so it's just, I think that that's sometimes hard, that picture that you see that help was there, and yet they couldn't reach him. 
and he was all he was alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard so. to live with that. I think it's just amazing that you share this story. It's so courageous of you, Linda. I think it, it helps. I think it just helps to know. I, I think help maybe other people as well. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not embarrassed by what path he chose. Frustrated could strangle him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it could happen to anybody. Absolutely. I mean, if that is, that's the thing. It could happen to anybody. And it only, you know, going back to, it only takes one try for some. That's all. One. And that's it. We wish you could reach more people with that message. Not they all accept it, but you just wish you could reach more people. Yeah. Uh, but I think it goes, you know, it goes back to mental health issues mm-hmm. and really looking at, you know, I, I look at middle school is a tough age. <laughs> and I think for Dylan, um, he had some learning challenges and he didn't want to be different. Mm-hmm. Right. He didn't want to be different. And yet. How do we embrace and tell our children that it's okay? Everyone's unique, you know. Um, and sometimes in a in a situation, they, people like to brand brand kids or brand individuals and not celebrate their individuality or or support their learning challenges. Or so it's just and they. <laughs> Hey, I laugh because Dylan also learned how to manipulate people, and I think that's what <laughs> you do to cover up for some of your. Oh, He's yeah. very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and I, I do. It's it is mental health. It is around that piece. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I think there's almost like a curtain or veil or facade that this is something that falls under, you know, class lines or it falls under where you live geographically or, you know, any number of factors. And the reality is that it's around us everywhere. And it's not always um, hard drugs either. You know, there's alcohol addiction. People can get addicted right. habitually to marijuana, to food, to anything. And, and it, the effect that it can have and and that, yeah, a lot of that does stem from, from mental illness and, and um, or even just, you know, anxieties and pressures and things. And right. so... Absolutely, I think that's important to to recognize and uh, to be aware of. Yeah, finding out the why. <laughs> yeah. Behind. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's part of this group is you know when you're talking with your kids, it's the why. You know how what does it do for you? Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of trying to figure on on peel back those onion layers and see what's going on, and and also able to maintain a healthy balance so that as a as a parent you you don't suffer as well that you find that balance have you ever at all and during this process felt any of um, that guilt or felt like your grief or suffering is somehow diminished because of um, the way that dylan passed have you experienced that at all because i know some people who have lost loved ones to addiction have sometimes felt that way and so i'm just curious if that's anything that you've had to deal with so, so I understand that if I felt um, guilt around guilt, or if you maybe felt that your grief was less valid, or if it was, oh, okay. yeah, you know, because sometimes yeah. people don't they see it as, oh, this was just their choice; they did this to themselves, and and that's not the case. This is a disease, and so, um, right. at any moments, were you dealing with that stigma or that issue? Yeah, I think the, the, what comes up for me is the what could I've done differently. I think if I had done this, you know, or if I reached out to this person, or if I known that, you know, you don't know. And I think that's, that's the challenge. You, you're kind of navigating the uncharted waters and you, in, in many ways, you're putting your trust in other people to, to help your child, you know, get well, but is trying to figure out how many different um, rehabs are out there. Are they good? What do they? What are their philosophies? Is that the right choice for your child? Mm-hmm. You know, are there other avenues that you can try that might be more successful? So I think those are the pieces that I think for me that happen sometimes is that you know, what if we had done this differently or recognize this? And and at times you have to you have to stop and say, 
I did the best I could for the information I had at the time. Mm-hmm. And that might, and that's hard sometimes. And I was going to ask you, Monica, it came up the other day. Do you have periods where you're just days that you're just sad? That you, you know, you just do I can't... have days that are just sad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that you can have sadness for no reason at all, no triggers, no anniversary, right. no you know special occasion or post that you saw on Facebook. You just are longing for your child. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, is there anything that you want to say about Dylan? Like, how how do we? How would you like us to remember him? Oh, just, you know, he was this amazing young, well, young, he was 25. He was, he, he was still young. I mean, young. he was just, yeah, he was just a caring, nurturing individual that had a smile that could light up a room, really knew how to, you know, work with people and individuals to feel, make them feel comfortable. Um <laughs> A jokester um, that he was leaving this one rehab, and so they brought a coconut and and dressed him up as Dylan so that he would still be in the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just I think that's just an amazing young man who had a really sensitive, caring, loving heart. Yeah, we can see where he got it. So, <laughs> you know, we will forever remember Dylan. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so much for, you. for being with us today. Yeah, Linda, this was incredible. I just, you amaze me so much because while you're doing all of this for Dylan, you are supporting your family and Doug, and you're supporting our family and providing so much happiness for us out on the farm. And you're also inspiring so many kids at your camp, you know, educating them and getting them outside, experiencing what it's like. And with this burden on your shoulders, you are just the strongest woman. One of them, I should say, <laughs> that I have ever met. And you, you just, thank you so much. You are incredible. Thank you. It means so much to me. So thank you. As long as you love. Thank you so much for listening. If you found this podcast helpful, please share our link with others and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Our podcast theme music is As Long As You Love, Scarlet Wings, written and sung by Cindy Bullins from the album Somewhere Between Heaven and Earth, produced by Blue Lobster Records. I'm Monica Charette, reminding you that you are never alone in your grief. Until next time, We'll be right here with you, holding the light. As long as you love.